In 1593, the plague pandemic hits London hard. Public life is severely affected. Theatres close for several months. Like the majority of his colleagues, William Shakespeare, aged 29, is out of work. He had just had his first real success with his Henry VI trilogy at the Rose Theatre. Now he has to find employment to support himself and his family back in Stratford. In a stroke of luck, he manages to ingratiate himself with a young Henry Risley, 3rd Earl of Southampton. Finding a powerful aristocratic patron was the best way to ward off the calamities that might beset an actor-playwright in late 16th century London. Unable to go on stage, Will Shakespeare turns to poetry. Let not my love be called idolatry, nor my beloved as an idol show, since all alike my songs and praises be to one, of one, still such, and ever so. Sometimes creativity and innovation flourish in particularly turbulent times. In the late 16th century, professional theatre establishes itself as a new medium in England. Queen Elizabeth I loves theatre. She clearly recognises its great potential for recreation, education and social bonding. She knows about the amazing powers of storytelling. Other monarchs fail to see the advantages of supporting the art of theatre. Yet, visitors who come to London from all over Europe are very curious about this new thing. They explicitly want to go and see those English plays and what they see inspires some to write home about it much to the good fortune of scholars today. The playhouses are social magnets, communicational hotspots in the city. Members of all classes, from the Duke to the lower stock hunt, come to see the plays. Not everybody in the audience has cause to love the government. On the contrary, there are many malcontents. Those who have a bone to pick with the ruling classes are eager to see and hear criticism and new social ideas played out in thrilling stories. And many playwrights comply. But even Queen Elizabeth's tolerance knows limits. Officials are constantly on their guard as to the play's possible explosive contents. Some members of her Privy Council, being already Puritan hardliners, suspect theatres to be spreaders not only of the plague, but also of other equally contagious mental pandemics. Theatres are hotbeds of sin. The plague is divine punishment for sin. Therefore, theatres are the reason for the plague. Here we go again. All plays had to be performed before the Master of Revels for approval, before they are open to the public. The master of revels is also the royal censor. Being a dramatist has its particular pitfalls. Actors and playwrights are persons of public interest. They have to tread very carefully. Too much irony towards the government is explicitly forbidden, as is open criticism. Overstepping these narrow boundaries is punishable by imprisonment, or worse, if you ever get caught being blatantly critical of the government, you can have a real problem on your hands. Time and again, there are purges among dramatists. In the course of his career, Will develops an instinct for how to weave criticism into the thread of his narratives without being held responsible. His audience understands him well enough, and his opponents can do nothing about it. Other dramatists are not quite as smart, or not as lucky. In March 1593, Thomas Kidd, the author of the highly successful Spanish tragedy, is arrested and tortured because incriminating posters had been found in his quarters. He claims they belong to Christopher Marlowe, with whom he shared his rooms for a while. Do you remember? Eight weeks later, Marlowe is killed in the Deptford docks while Thomas Kidd is still in prison. Kidd never recovers from the injuries inflicted by torture, he dies the following year. But many Londoners, very much like their queen, love theatre. 
So theatre's opponents can never raise their heads too boldly or the Queen will box their ears. Take a good look at her famous portraits. Observe the details. Everything is there for a maximum dramatic effect. There is much of an actress in her. And, yes, she always wears a mask. Nevertheless, Will is conscious that he always runs the risk of imprisonment. His best defence is a network of powerful aristocratic friends like the young Earl of Southampton. Hard work, dear Will, to keep on humouring all those who need to be humoured. Besides, your interests do not end with Southampton. Will is a professional actor. It is an educated assumption on my part that he loves his job. He wants to carry on acting and writing for the London stages once this darn pandemic is over. He aspires to become a regular member and maybe a shareholder in one of the big acting troops. He will succeed, of course, but that is a story for another time. Right now, he has no idea what life has in store for him. We do not really know his exact whereabouts in 1593. He stays in London, though, and we can imagine Will spending time at the Southampton Estates in Holborn or in Titchfield. A domestic friend, as it were, amply showing his gratefulness towards the young lord. He is well aware that he is buttering up to Southampton. Let not my love be called idolatry, <laughs> nor my beloved as an idol show, since all alike my songs and praises be to one of one, still such and ever so. <laughs> kind is my love today. Tomorrow kind. Still constant in a wondrous excellence. <laughs> Therefore my verse to constancy confined, one thing expressing leaves out difference. Fair, kind and true is all my argument. True. <laughs> Fair, kind and true, varying to other words. Yeah. And in this change is my invention spent. Three themes in one, which wondrous scope affords. Fair, kind and true have often lived alone. Which three till now never kept seat in one? <laughs> <laughs> Let not my love be called idolatry, nor my beloved as an idol show. I personally find this a somewhat strange sonnet. At first sight, of course, it is about love. Sonnets in general are focused on love. That's their scope. So are the Shakespearean sonnets. Almost all 154 of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. In this sonnet, 105, the poet takes a defensive stance right from the first line. Let not my love be called idolatry. As if he's engaged in an argument trying to convince another person that his feelings are neither excessive, over the top, nor built on unrealistic assumptions. Not my love be called idolatry. Idolatry? Is somebody else reproaching him of being idolatrous because he seems obsessed with one subject only? Or is he having second thoughts about his own feelings? And then he reinforces his protest that the subject of his infatuation is not an idol. What's an idol? According to Encyclopedia Britannica, idol, literally an image from the Greek eidolon, particularly an image used as an object of worship. In philosophy, the word can mean a prejudice of some kind that hinders clear thought. It was used in this sense by Giordano Bruno and adopted from him by Sir Francis Bacon. Bacon was a renowned contemporary of Shakespeare. Will may have learned a few things from Bacon's writings. He goes on to praise the constancy of his beloved, whoever that is, man or woman. We will never ultimately know to whom Shakespeare really addressed his sonnets. Let us look at this sonnet 105 for a moment. Three quatrains, three times four lines, one ending couplet. That's the Shakespearean sonnet. 
there are other sonnet forms like the earlier Petrarchan sonnet. In fact, the sonnet form was imported from the Italian. Shakespeare developed his own sonnet form written in iambic pentameter. The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Let not my love be called idolatry, nor my beloved as an idol show, since all alike my songs and praises be to one, of one, still such, and ever so. Look at the strong emphasis of this last line of the first quatrain. Iambic pentameter is the rhythm of our hearts, with to one, of one, still such, and ever so. This heart is beating strongly, indicative of a strong emotion. Now, the following line shifts the stress from didum to dum didum. Kind is my love today, tomorrow kind, right? He could have written, my love is kind today. He did not. He draws the attention to this particular word, kind. Kind is my love today, tomorrow kind, still constant in a wondrous excellence. Therefore, my verse to constancy confined, one thing expressing, leaves out difference. With therefore my verse to constancy confined, one thing expressing, leaves out difference, he is almost apologetic for not being imaginative enough. Then... In the third quatrain, he turns the argument around, as his beloved is wonderfully fair, kind and true, there is no need for too much eloquence. That's the gist of the message here. Let us look once more at the rhythm. He goes dum dum di dum. He skips the unstressed bead at the beginning. The following line is identical in its beginning. Then there is yet another shift in rhythm varying to other words. Think of it in terms of heartbeats. The rhythm is far from even. This heart has a lot to do. Even the very last line lets the heart trip. Never kept seat in one. Fair, kind and true is still my argument. Fair, kind and true, varying to other words. And in this change is my invention spent. Three themes in one, which wondrous scope affords, fair, kind and true, have often lived alone, which three till now never kept seat in one. I'm overdoing it, of course. The third quatrain quite often contains the reverse of arguments brought forth in the first two. That's called a volta. I cannot really detect a volta in arguments here, but a volta in rhythm. From the performer's point of view, that's exciting, literally. The rhythm suggests a bit of a fluttering heart. This suggests somebody whose emotional world is out of equilibrium because of love. Hmm. Really? Why does he harp so much on fair, kind and true? He really drives it home with repeating fair, kind and true three times until he reaches the concluding couplet. These attributes also imply other meanings, of course, not only beauty or simply blonde hair, but fairness, gentleness, truthfulness, the opposite of being false or deceitful, to be true to somebody and also being a real person. Virtues, to be sure. But Shakespeare is no paragon of virtue, he's no prig. Other virtues, like chastity, for example, he seems to take with a pinch of salt. We'll come to that later. Why, then, is Will so obsessed with constancy and loyalty? Surely, we all want love and friendship to last forever. On a personal level, we can take his words at face value. But things are never quite as simply layered with Will Shakespeare. Let us pause here with the sonnets and look at the political backdrop for a moment. In school, we learn that the Elizabethan age was a golden age for England. It was far from golden for those who had to live through it. 
Almost the whole of Europe experienced politically unstable, violent times. And so did England. In this ominous year, 1593, the second year of the plague, the hottest summer of a century, according to some scholars, Elizabeth I turned 60, a considerable age then. She has been on the throne for 35 years, but she is childless and, to her advisor's massive headache, refuses to pronounce a successor. Monarchies run on succession, needless to say. It has been England's great luck that the Virgin Queen proves to be a very prudent monarch. Somehow she has always managed to steer her country through wars, rebellions, failing crops and religious strife. Religion in particular is the great stumbling block of the age. Protestant Queen Elizabeth I has repeatedly been the target of assassins acting on behalf of her Catholic opponents, in particular Philip II of Spain, her one-time brother-in-law and then suitor. Seems a bit off, doesn't it? It is quite tricky to relate even half the historical upheavals without boring you out of your minds. Yet, they shaped Will's reality and subsequently his work. So, I will try a little trick of the trade on you. Perhaps you've seen the drama series The Tudors, or more recently Game of Thrones. Oh, how could I ask? <laughs> well, Game of Thrones is a fantasy series, to be sure. But author G.R.R. R. Martin once said in an interview that he modelled his storylines on English history. So, when I give you a brief fictional narrative based on events in 16th century England, think of it as Game of Thrones minus the dragons. Although I love dragons. Imagine, you are a contemporary of William Shakespeare, a subject to Elizabeth I. You live in London. Your family has been in the cloth trade for three generations. Your granddad had founded the business. Your dad has taken over. And now you are the junior partner. The story begins when your granddad was a young man. In 1521, he went on a business trip to the continent. There, he heard Martin Luther preach. But what toppled him over there were the Protestant songs, especially one of the songs Luther himself had composed. Nun freut euch, lieben Christen gemein, und lasst uns freuen. Nun freut euch, liebe Christen gemein. People were singing it in the streets. He was impressed, but also utterly confused. A mere song could convert people. When he returned to London, he was so relieved to see the natural order of things restored when his king, Henry VIII, vehemently opposed Luther in his pamphlet, Declaration of the Seven Sacraments Against Martin Luther. But then... Chaos ensued when King Henry VIII insisted on divorcing his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, because he wanted to marry Protestant Anne Bullen at all costs. In an outrageously willful act, or so it seemed then, Henry VIII set himself up as the head of the newly founded Anglican Church and burned his boat with Rome. Henry still heard mass, though but he abolished all monasteries and kept their estates and venues. A centuries-old cultural heritage was destroyed. The sparks from Anne Bullen's beautiful eyes had set ablaze more than Henry's heart. The people, on the other hand, never took to this seductress and whore, as the Spanish ambassador called her. For weeks, your granddad went about in a state of agitation. He even considered leaving the country. But where should he transplant his business, his whole family? To France? No. He was too stout an Englishman to live comfortably among the French. To Italy? The country, if you could call it that, was much too shattered by political discord, a battleground of competing interests, literally. The Low Countries with Emperor Charles V grinding down on them. Bad idea. One of the German duchies? <laughs> Definitely not. 
That Luther is a German, no? He carried the torch to set Europe ablaze with the publication of his darn thesis. So, Granddad remained in London, ever on guard, ever exhorting his wife and his kids to be careful whom to trust, never to talk too much. Three years into the marriage, on May the 6th, 1536, Henry had his Queen Anne Bullen executed on Tower Green. <laughs> Kings and queens had been killed before, but in secret, behind the curtains of politics. The execution of a queen was something unheard of. That was the year your dad was born. Henry's daughter by Anne Bullen, three-year-old Elizabeth, was declared illegitimate by her own father, the king, so he could marry Jane Seymour. Your granddad had hated the late queen, but that went too far, even for him. The future seemed to brighten up. Henry and the whole kingdom rejoiced when at last Jane Seymour gave him the heir he had so longed for, little Prince Edward. Your granddad was content for one, but he secretly pined for his old faith. And then things got worse. Henry VIII gradually turned into a tyrant. Executions took place on a daily basis and people cowered, anxious not to attract too much attention. Cloth merchants, though, made good money. Henry had an insatiable taste for luxury. The whole country heaved a sigh of relief when he died in 1547. But his son, Edward VI, was a mere child, a boy king. He was ruled by others. His uncle, Edward Seymour, first Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector of the Realm, who amply handed out gifts to his supporters while others bitterly opposed him. The outcome was predictable. Intrigue and corruption was rife, the royal coffers empty, taxes went through the ceiling, riots abounded, nobody was safe. And then things got worse. Young Edward was a stout Protestant. He imposed compulsory services in England. That is to say, everybody had to attend the Protestant service on Sunday on pain of punishment. Your granddad was miserable about the new faith, but he kept his counsel to himself, even letting his only surviving son, your dad, be educated a Protestant in order to protect him. Uneasiness in the family grew when Edward VI died at the age of 15 in the summer of 1553. Shortly before his death, he nominated his Protestant cousin, Lady Jane Grey, as his successor. She became Queen Jane for nine days only. July 1553. How your granddad rejoiced, danced and feasted with his neighbours the day Catholic Mary Tudor took over, Henry's eldest daughter. She quickly disposed of Lady Grey and was proclaimed Queen of England. Your dad was hurried to church to be re-baptised a Catholic despite his protests. The first inkling that things would go sideways was when Queen Mary had Jane Grey executed four months later. The tables turned once and for all when Mary started a witch hunt for Protestants. She gave orders to publicly burn 280 noble Protestant descenders at the stake. Half your family's neighbours had to flee England in a hurry to escape that burning. People started to call her Bloody Mary. Your dad was in his teens and he strongly resented Bloody Mary's doings, but he was smart enough to keep mum about it. Queen Mary married the very Catholic Philip II of Spain and became his queen consort. This particular marriage did not sit well with her independence-loving English subjects, who feared to become a subordinated Habsburgian property. Philip II was a prince of Habsburg. Your granddad became deeply depressed. Your dad could hardly contain his anger. Things got really tight. And then, hooray! 1558, Bloody Mary died, childless, and named her half-sister Elizabeth as her successor. Now it is Elizabeth Tudor's turn to become Queen Elizabeth I of England and Ireland. She, of course, is a Protestant. 
For many years now, Elizabeth has teased Europe's princes with a prospect of marriage, dangling the bait England before their eyes. Philip II was especially eager to swallow England whole. He had almost succeeded a spouse to Bloody Mary. Then there came the day when Queen Bess made up her mind and put it across to the rest of the world. There is only one mistress in England and no master. For her contemporaries, this has been absolutely mind-boggling. But then she also brings the English Reformation to a conclusion. She makes the Anglican Church truly and permanently independent of Rome. 1570. Pope Pius V sees fit to declare her excommunicated, illegitimate and a heretic. Every good Catholic is called upon to kill the heretic. Some try. Let us change scenes for a moment. Paris. The night from the 23rd to the 24th of August, 1572. The wedding between Catholic Isabelle de Valois and Protestant Henri de Navarre should have been a gesture of conciliation. On the orders of the fundamentalist Catholic Henri Duc de Guise, it ends in a terrible massacre. More than 3,000 French Huguenots die in Paris alone that night. Some are able to escape. Amongst them, a young woman. A week later, a scraggle of Huguenot fugitives disembark from an English merchant ship at the port of London. The captain took pity on those poor souls. The young woman steps down from the gangplank and almost bumps into a stately tradesman waiting there for the cargo to be unloaded. Their eyes meet. Countless times you have heard the story of how your mom and dad met. Shortly after their wedding, your dad took over the business and re-established the trade first with Antwerp, when the Dutch revolt broke out and the Low Countries once more were drenched in blood and burned to cinders by the Habsburgian Spaniard, Philip II, and his bloodhound, the Duke of Alba, Dad turned to Nuremberg for trade. Nuremberg is one of the first independent German cities to turn Protestant. It was also one of Europe's major players in international trade, had given sanctuary to many Protestant fugitives, yet remained amazingly tolerant towards all kinds of people, as long as they are good for business. Your dad's main partner there is a former Dutch cloth merchant, now a citizen of Nuremberg, who had just been able to re-establish himself and his office right in the centre, just a few paces away from the magnificent church of St. Sebald. You are looking forward to visiting him. Shortly before the visit, you and your dad go to see the Admiral's men playing Marlowe's Dr. Faustus at the Rose. You and your dad start an argument. He hates the play, calls it atheistic and blasphemous. This Marlowe deserves the hangman's attention. You retort, Faustus is brilliant. Everybody has the right to ask for enlightenment. Nonsense. God will punish those who trespass. He will punish us all for that. These new playwrights are a veritable threat. Just look at the other, that, that, what's his name, Shakespeare, Shakespeare, and he's fucking brilliant. Still quarrelling, you arrive at home, open the door. Your mom, your otherwise gentle and loving mom, has one of her fits again. She just sits and stares into the air for hours, for days. She doesn't wash, doesn't eat. Her hair is greasy and lank. She smells awful. She sits there, unresponsive. Sometimes she starts whimpering. Her whimpers grow into wails that make your hair stand on end. Nothing. Nobody can stop her. You have to let her carry on until her voice cracks. Don't go near, or she would attack you, scratch and bite you like a magic cur. There are the nights when suddenly her screams shatter the air. 
You sit up in bed, startled, confused. Oh, she's having her nightmares again. That terrible night of St. Bartholomew in Paris so many years ago, when she had witnessed how her father was stabbed in the back, her mother's throat cut, her siblings lying there in their blood with contorted limbs, their throats cut too. You stand there at the foot of the stairs, servants and family together, bleary-eyed, pale, light in hand, looking up towards the master bedroom. You slowly ascend the stairs. You open the bedchamber door. Your dad is holding her in his arms, rocking her, whispering gently, caressing her limp hair. She is but a shadow, a trembling, moaning shadow. Your dad's lower lip is cracked, dripping drops of blood onto his torn nightshirt and into her hair. He winks at you to please leave. Gently, you close the door. A sonnet comes into your mind. A sonnet from this playwright, Shakespeare, whom your father despises so much. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with a remover to remove. Oh, no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, his worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love is not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with these brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Today, many European countries have secular societies where freedom of belief is honoured, but religion is no longer above the law. It's a lesson learned from our historic past when religion was inextricably intertwined with every aspect of life, and some of those who were in power committed appalling acts of cruelty in the name of religion. This is stuff for movies, distant past for many of us, once upon a time. Once upon a time, it was real, just as real as the last 10, 20, 40 years are real for us. And we too witness religious fundamentalism on the rise again. Thousands of people having to leave their homes and take refuge from war and oppression, begging others for shelter. Events of our recent past shape our responses for present challenges. For William Shakespeare, the deeds of Henry VIII and Bloody Mary was recent past. Elizabeth I and Philip II of Spain present. How does he respond? More of that next time.